we are 60 to 90 meters below the surface. The first treasures arrived in 1940 and were hung on the walls where possible. Hi, I'm Daniel, this is Asheville, and today I'm in an underground bunker used in World War II to store valuable artifacts, while a quarry above loads a train full of decorative aggregates destined for our yard. I'm in the north of Wales at a group of slate quarries owned and operated by the Breeden Group. Here we can see how roof slate products are made, how construction and decorative aggregates are made as a byproduct of the production of the slate roofing, the world's fastest zip line, an underground bunker from World War II used to store valuable artifacts from the National Gallery in London, and a train being loaded of decorative aggregates heading for our yard in West Drayton. In case you didn't know, Asheville are a group of companies based in London who offer aggregates, waste management, concrete, plant hire, and construction services. Now we already offer our customers in the London market aggregates such as sand, gravel, type one, and other sub-base materials. We wanted to expand our portfolio of products using our existing infrastructure. And we thought that decorative aggregates would be the way forward. Decorative aggregates are used in gardening and landscaping projects as the final pieces to add color and character to any outdoor space. Now we import by rail, so we needed to find a partner who could produce in large quantities and manage to get it loaded onto a train. When I found out how the material was made and the historic significance of the site, I had to come here myself and see it happen and see our very first train get loaded. This is the actual material and train destined for our yard. But before we look at this, let's explore the quarry. The first historical reference to the quarry was in 1570. The slate reserves in the ground are currently unknown, but for the next 40 years there is material which is economically viable to extract. There is £6 million worth of plant on site and as many as 170 people work in the quarry. Annually, the quarry produces 4 million roofing slates, which is sold in the British, Irish, European, American, and Australasian markets. The quarry also produces half a million tons of aggregate, which is a mixture of construction and decorative products. And one very cool fact is that all the benches you can see in the quarry are named after people. For hundreds of years, the creation of roofing slate products was done manually. Now this is a very labor intensive process called slate splitting. Nowadays, machines automate some of the process, but master slate splitters, as they're called, are still very much in demand. For some elements of the process, you need to look, feel, and use judgment gained over decades to make production decisions. As with many quarries, the process here starts with a blast. The slate is inspected at every stage in the production to ensure it is suitable and doesn't have any faults. After the blast, material which passes the first inspection is then transported to the production area. A wheel loader with a pecker breaks larger pieces down into smaller sizes and then another wheel loader with forks moves the material into a separate sorting area before it's brought into the workshop. When inspecting the slate, what we're looking for is these naturally straight occurring cleavage lines. This lets us know when we try to split it, it will split flat and not break. A telltale sign of a piece of slate that will not work for roofing products is one which has waves going up and down. Slate which does not make the cut for roofing products is moved to a separate area and inspected to see if it can be used for architectural finishing like walling and memorial stones. If the material is not suitable for architectural products, it is then used to create aggregates. It is crushed and dry screened to create construction aggregates in various sizes and decorative aggregates in 20mm and 40mm sizes. 
Once in the workshop, a specialist called a marker again inspects and decides if the material can be used. The marker is looking for faults and best utilization of the blocks. The chosen slate is then sawn down, first length and then by width to the desired size. Then it goes on rollers to a wet area. It's called the wet area because the slate is now wet from the cutting process. It is then quality checked again. Only 3% of material is used. This is the auto splitter. When this machine cannot be used, then it's done manually by the master slate splitters. Machines are used where possible, but those which need more finesse are worked on by a master slate splitter who uses a hammer and chisel to break down the slate into thinner sheets. The slate may not split from one side. You need to feel the ridges with your hands and chisel. If it doesn't work, you spin it round to another side and this is done repeatedly until you get it right. You cannot force the slate to work in which the way you want. You must work with it and around its natural composition. Okay, so I'm gonna try my hand as a master slate splitter. Hey, look at that. So this process is continually repeated till we can break it down into sizes of five and a half mil, seven mil, and nine mil. Hey, again, hang at this. Master slate splitting is a process that has been handed down for generations, something which this area are and should be very proud of. Once split down to size, each and every tile is quality checked again and then separated into piles based on their size, which are 500 mil by 300 mil, 400 mil by 250 mil, and 300 mil by 200 mil. The next part of the process is called slate dressing. This is where a machine adds a chamfered edge. This is done so the tiles can sit flush on a roof and water can run off it. Holes are also created so nails can fix the tiles to the timber battens on a roof. Everything which fails quality control within the workshop process is removed via this conveyor belt the loading shovel takes it to be examined for the other processes I mentioned earlier. World War II started in 1939. With the world in chaos and turmoil, the British government were taking steps to defend its land and people. Because of the horrors taking place in Europe, they also decided that history and creation needed to survive and be preserved for better days. A location was needed, which was remote, capable and secure. There is no evidence of the facility from above ground, just this very unassuming gated entrance. This is an underground facility used in World War II to store the treasures from the National Gallery when bombs began to fall on London. Now this subterranean structure is made up of five brick-built areas which are within the quarry taverns. We are 60 to 90 meters below the surface. Now the first treasures arrived in 1940 and were hung on the walls where possible. Trucks and trains were used for the transportation, but it was challenging. Some of the artifacts struggled to make the journey due to their size and shape. Small wedges were made and inserted into the wall. The pictures were hung on top of these. We can see evidence here, here, and here. And if we look over here, we can see an electrical cable. Now this would have been connected to a light fitting, which would light a picture, which was here. 
By the summer of 1941, the entire collection from the National Art Gallery was stored in this subterranean facility. In total, there were 2,200 pictures here. We can see areas where safety work has taken place. If you have a look here, the slate has been drilled, anchors fitted and chains attached to try to keep hold of the slate and make sure it doesn't fall down on top of us. A track system has been installed here and there were small trolleys which run on these rails. This is what was used to move the pictures around in these areas. Considerable work had to be undertaken down here to ensure the temperature and humidity did not damage any of the treasures. Now power and humidification equipment was installed to ensure that the damp and dark conditions didn't damage any of the paintings. To accept the paintings, over the process of a year, 5,000 tonnes of rock had to be removed, the brick storerooms were created, and the entrance enlarged in preparation. Local people were employed to help look after the site, and some National Gallery staff were accommodated nearby. Unfortunately, parts of this subterranean space have been reclaimed by the mountain, and avalanches of slate have overwhelmed the brick structures so we can only explore areas still deemed safe. Due to the remote location, power cuts could be an issue. So a 150 horsepower diesel generator was installed. Once the war ended, the paintings were shipped back to the National Gallery where they were enjoyed and celebrated once again. Nowadays, in this part of the world, the quickest method of travel is the zip line. Once you get going, you travel up to 125 miles an hour over this 1.5 kilometer stretch. This is the fastest zip line in the world. Let's get back and check on the process of the train loading. It's 22 wagons and each wagon takes 75 tons of material. We have nine wagons of blue, we have nine wagons of plum, and we have four wagons of gray. That means 675 tons of plum, 675 tons of blue, and 300 tons of gray. That's 1,650 tons in total. This entire train took three hours to load. Decorative aggregates are slightly different from construction aggregates and larger in volume. Care needs to be taken when loading to evenly spread the material throughout the wagons. This rail service is being operated by our good friends at GB Rail Freight. Now it's 245 rail miles to get back to the yard. This is gonna take 11 hours and 36 minutes. So we're gonna leave now and head back to the yard to ensure we're there when this arrives. The train has arrived and it's being offloaded. It's a joyous moment. Now, as much as Breeden and ourselves wanted to bring these new products into the London market, we wanted to do it with the lowest carbon footprint possible. If the amount of material in this train was transported by 32 ton eight before tippers, it would take 87 round trips. 
is 263.5 miles one way. That's each round trip being 527 miles. If we times that by 87 journeys, that's 45,000 849 HGV miles taken off our roads. That's less traffic, less emissions, and still stimulating economic growth. The Breeden Welsh Slate Quarries are a story of creation, preservation, and sustainability. Artists created masterpieces, which the quarry protected. Master Slate Splitter Sculpt Rock to create products to shelter us from the natural elements. As a byproduct, material is produced which brings character to buildings and outdoor spaces. And a rail connection provides a distribution option with the lowest carbon footprint possible. Thank you to the Breeding Group for providing access and all their hospitality. And thank you to you for watching. Let us know any other uses you know of Slate, what you think of the underground bunker, and any other quarries internationally you would like us to showcase.